Hey, everyone. Here's the question of the, of the day. To build or not to build AI models? That and more on Textron Gang. Hi, happy Wednesday, everyone. It's Alan Schimmel here at TechStrong Studios for a TechStrong Gang. We've got a great gang lineup and some great, meaty, juicy topics that we want to hit on. Um, I want to let me introduce you to today's gang. I want to start off with this is, I believe, his first time on. He's, you know, he doesn't even have his colors yet. So, you know, not a permanent gang member. We're giving him a tryout, but I think he's going to do great. He's part of the uh, Visible Impact team at Futurum Group. He, well, our friend Mike Fazard knows him for a long time, and if Mike vouches for him, he becomes a friend of his, not necessarily a friend of ours yet. But <laughs> and guy has Bronx creds. <laughs> and, and he has Bar- Bronx creds, too. Extra points for that. Let me Very introduce easy. you to Guy Courier. Guy, how are you? Great. Happy to be here for, yes, the first time. Uh, Mike and I do go a long way back, um, and uh, it's great to be here. Thanks. Thank you. All right. But you're not in the Bronx anymore, right, Guy? Where are you these days? In spirit, I'll always be in the Bronx as well as my uh, my, my the place of my youth, Minneapolis, Minnesota. So I carry both of them with me. But I'm in uh, Austin, Texas. Beautiful. Welcome, and thanks for joining us, Guy. Um, also joining us today from – Deep in the heart of Texas, San Angelo, Texas. It's our editor for TechStrong AI, Digital CXO, and so much more, Amanda Rosani. Hey, Amanda, how are you? Hello, good. Glad to be here. Glad to have you on. And then from deep in the heart of Texas up to the top of the Rocky Mountains, joining us is our CTO and and full and uh, Futurum Group CTA, Mitch Ashley. Hey, Mitchell, welcome. Uh, good to be here. We're about halfway up to the top of the Rockies, but yeah, I didn't know what you meant. So they get I guess higher. the day is yet young. You can still get higher. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll sign on when I get up there. <laughs> yeah. All right. And then I'm happy to be having joining him back at my left hand here, also hailing from the Bronx, but back home in lovely Boca Raton. It's our chief content officer, Mike Vizard. Hey, Mike. And I was in the Bronx yesterday, so there you go. You were in the Bronx. You did not bring the Yankees much good luck. I went to the Saturday game. You went to the game they won. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, maybe you did. Them. Maybe you should go to every game. That's what I did. But um, anyway, Mike, welcome back. It's good to have you back here. So, guys, opening up to build or not build AI models, right? Building your own AI models. You know, this has been uh, an evolving subject and evolving question as we've gotten more comfortable with vector databases and LLMs and small language modules and all of the ins and outs of this and and training. Mike, what's the story here? There's a story on TechStrong AI. It's about a survey that Volter, cloud service provider, uh, sponsored. And they hired SMP intelligence to go do this survey. And, and you have to read it closely because they went very narrow on who they were interviewing. So they went after folks who had AI expertise already and they were working for mid to large enterprises. But it was surprising to me to discover that on average, those organizations were already running 150 models on average in production environments. And there's this ongoing debate as to whether or not you should build AI models because some folks are saying that you won't keep pace with the big hyperscalers who are investing in this space or open AI and you'll always be behind the curve. And then others are saying, I don't want to be dependent upon those people. So Mitch, what's your take on what's going on here? Can I get by with RAG alone or is everybody going to need to build something that looks like an AI model eventually? Well, it was a very interesting study. Like you said, it just kind of pointed me to, these are people who have been doing this for a while. You don't go from zero to 150 in nine months, right? If, if you do, you've got chaos. Um, so I imagine a lot of those models are machine learning as well as maybe some, you know, uh, kind of models, expert system models, things like that. And definitely large organizations are doing a lot of their own model creation. They're using third party to do it. If they don't 
if they're new to it. Um, you know, they're for, forming, you know, data engineering, AI engineering teams to do that kind of work as part of their processes. Now adding generative AI, so you get into the RAG uh, part of it, as well as uh, vector databases and things you mentioned, Mike, that that are part of that ecosystem of technology that you used. I was surprised by 150, even, I guess, in a large organization, you think like a really large bank or insurance company, that that would make sense. You don't think about it on you know, that scale, but I would think a, a mid-sized organization having 150 AI models would be pretty unique. It, it was really clear, though, that you know they've made investments and they see more investments coming or being made in AI in the future. They're kind of bought in, right? So it's beyond the pilot trial stage. It's you were going to keep accelerating your adoption. And there's also a heavy reliance on the third parties to help people get that domain expertise to be able to build these kind of models, which I think a lot of people have to rely on because it's just very scarce to find AI talent. So maybe somebody can use this as, as a report to kind of help justify, yes, we're not totally on the bleeding edge, even though internally we may be. Uh, there are others that are out there doing this. It's just you need to find the right partners. Guy, um is this just the age-old bill versus buy conversation all over again as we kind of look at AI models? And uh, will most people wind up buying rather than building? Well, I think most people will do both. And I think it is the age-old discussion, and it's the age-old framing of it as one or the other, when in fact, uh, not only is it a continuum, of course, um, but different stages of development of, of AI on um, require different types of work. So one of the things I noticed in the story was uh, how frequent these models were proof of concept. This is a way for AI developers to learn, to try things out, um, to learn how models work. We have to remember these aren't all generative AI. Non-generative AI models have been around for quite a while uh, for prediction, for recommendation, that sort of thing, you know. So, yeah, it's the same old story uh, all over again, just maybe five times as fast. What struck me is they are putting all this investment into proof of concepts, but when they find ones that are valuable, that they don't have a way to um, move forward at that point and be uh, have a plan for success. So that was interesting. There needs to be a little bit more of a plan there in place. Yeah, it's a really good point, Amanda, because... A lot of people are trying to still understand what's the right problem to solve with what kind of AI, or should I even be using AI to do that? Um, when I've talked to really large organizations, enterprises that have been doing AI for a while, one of the roadblocks they run into is just managing the models. You get It's like version control of software, but you know, its own kind of complexity for expert system models, AI models. And there are platforms, kind of AI ops platforms for managing that. But it's, it's easily, imagine having all those things out there and now what do I do with it? Do I keep it up to date? What data feeds into it? Who knows all that stuff? It comes with its own kind of workflow complexities and data management requirements, which I'm oh, guessing own, is part of that yeah. that roadblock they hit. Its own life cycle. I mean, um, I mm -hmm. think there are, there are maybe three life cycles related to AI because there's the model training there's the model tuning, and then there's the RAG part, um, which is not quite as germane to this because we're talking about building your own models, um, but tuning models alone, uh, that uh, tuning more general purpose models is a critical path right now for a lot of the use of generative AI in order to make it more specific and differentiated to whatever your organization does, not just the industry that you're in, but how your organization operates so that complexity, which comes straight out of the dev world, um, is now applied to really what are not applications themselves, but services, parts of applications. I mean, Mitch, when you talk about um, what purpose are you putting the AI to, one of the things I, I like to say now is there really isn't any such thing as an AI application. There's AI injected into existing applications, and there are so many ways to do this that just scoping and trying to figure out a, what you're trying to do or what you're trying to add to an existing application, and then B, how to get there quickly and productively and safely, that's enough to handle already. And that's where the build your own sort of comes in. It's just, it's not pure build your own. The number of organizations out there that can build 
robust, reasonably active, re- reasonably accurate, large scale models is very limited because of the compute power required. But the ability of almost any organization of any size to take something that has been trained uh, for general purpose and then tune it and then add it maybe with RAG into an application, that's a lot more accessible. And that's critical. That's where that 150 number comes from, in my view. These aren't just models. These are many different instantiations of something being used throughout an organization. All depends on how you count. Well, look, to me, this is going to be a classic of the have and the have not, right? In order to build your own model, you're going to have to have a level of scale of resources that I think are going to leave out a lot of the SMB, SMB market, right? I think it, it plays to the larger enterprises. Now, can we get third-party providers who are going to give us models based upon vertical or, or you know, some other demographic kind of data? Yeah. Is it going to be as good as a custom-built model? Probably not especially over time when we get better at building custom models like this. And so what you're going to have is like what we have in many other areas of technology. If you have the resources to do something custom, you're going to do it and you're going to have an advantage over someone who bought something off the shelf, cut software versus custom written software. Now, OTS does offer you know, some advantages in that a lot of people use it so they get more feedback and it, it moves along. But clearly, if you have the the wherewithal to build your own custom models and do them well. I think you'll see the rise of these, what they're calling smaller and now mid-sized language models. And I will tell them from specific domains and people will use that. And I think you might see smaller companies down that path. But we mentioned that, um, you know, I grew up in the Bronx in the 70s and 80s, so I have trust issues. <laughs> and, and, and this issue, we know, Mike. This we know. <laughs> and, and my issue with this is like, all right, so if I'm going to use the open AI or Microsoft or Amazon or Google or whatever it is, I'm not 100% comfortable that they won't change the licensing terms or move the goalposts and what will happen to my data after I kind of share it with them and through a RAG methodology? So I'm kind of more inclined at the very least for my most critical data, maybe to build my own if I can find that way to make that easier. And I think tech will get easier. So Mitch, I don't know. Am I crazy or what? Well, you're, you're spot on in this way. Earlier this week, um, it became public that OpenAI had a security breach in 2023. Had it investigated, went to the board, but they kept it all private. They didn't tell anybody externally until now it's just coming out and secrets were stole, uh, stolen, I assume, for uh, accessing via APIs. I'm not sure what else data was taken. So, you know, trust is, is goes a lot of areas. It's not only the to what you pointed out of what's the agreement and how I can use the data and are they going to use my data? There's also just the security of a service that's a, that's a hosted model or hosted generative AI type of application. You know, I was thinking about the other part of this that um, we often don't talk as much about is to do machine learning takes massive amounts of data. The reason why machine learning works is because you have very large quantities of, of data. I mean, literally terabytes of data that, that you feed into these algorithms because that's what it, especially if you're going to do unsupervised where it goes and figures out patterns. It doesn't know what the patterns mean, but it figures out the patterns and learns from that. Uh, supervised is more guided, like this is a car. That's not a car. You know, so some, some way of instructing the, the algorithms of what matches what you're looking for and it learns what those patterns are. But that's only because it has a lot of data that comes with it. To Alan's point, what medium-sized enterprise SMB organization is sitting on a mountain of data that also has been kind of feature set groomed so that algorithms can actually use that data in, in, a, in an application? To Guy's point, you know, as, as supplementing to an application, that's a lot of investment for people to make. And you don't do that as a small company. So I think there is a, we're creating sort of this AI digital divide also in company size organizations. 
Yeah, sometimes when I look at that whole space, I go, so data, if it's like money, like you're saying to me, let me put my money in a bank that I know that someone's trying to hold up every other day. So, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but that's the internet. Yeah. You know, right, I, so I, I, this open AI hack to someone that I saw someone pose a question the other day. Geez, I, I wonder if that the fact that they were hacked makes it possible that the Chinese can hack them. What makes you think they did it, Norman? Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, it does. It, it, you know, trust in your data being secure in the internet, you know, that, that could be the fourth biggest lie. I don't know. I, I could, I want checks in the mail. At least if I can hang out in a smaller spot that maybe no one knows as much about, I might not get in as much as the thought. Okay. Well, it have to be faster when, than you, not the bear, right? <laughs> right. But, but, you know, that, so that's the whole cloud security thing too, kind of way too. But the other, the, the flip side of that is because I recognize that I've created such a target and I, I've amassed multiple data sets or what have you in this case, I also have more resources to make it more impenetrable. Right. Is the is the Amazon is the AWS infrastructure harder to hack than the the average infrastructure in a, a, a data center? I would say AWS infrastructure is more secure, but all the processes involved in my moving the data into that environment and all the stuff yeah. that I connect to it is way less secure than if I was just sitting in my own little private cloud somewhere. It's not the it's not the AWS infrastructure itself. That- that or, or any of the big providers um, where security is is lacking or unavailable. It's the fact that <laughs> they're part of the world. They got a gajillion users. Everybody's trying to get in there just to do their regular stuff. Um, and you're relying on all kinds of uh, uh, good faith action everywhere and, and intelligent, you know, uh, uh, capable, experienced activity by all of these different customers and users and so forth. That's that's the problem, the size of it. Yeah, all the AWS security, security doesn't right. prevent you from keeping your S3 bucket open to the world. Exactly. You know, that, right. If you do that, okay, you do that. I yeah. do want to say one thing, which is that, that um, Alan, I think your point about the digital divide is, 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 is a good one. That's a really good one. The size of the models right now for the largest – you know, general purpose models, the foundation, they're called, there's been called foundational models is puny compared to what they're going to be in two years. The amount of data is puny. Uh, it, we've seen this over and over again. Something that seems huge, seems huge, massive, unprecedented now becomes ho hum shortly. So I think that there actually is a, a great opportunity for the mid sized and up and even smaller ones to do their own thing with AI by using the foundational models and tuning because tuning doesn't necessarily take all that data. It takes well curated data as opposed to large amounts of it. And I think that that's the model that we have now. The trade off of building your own even mid sized model is time. You can get to market much more quickly by tuning something that exists than by recreating it. Speaking of time, we're about out of time for this subject mm-hmm. right here. I guess time will tell, continuing the riff, on uh, on what to build or not to build. That is the question. We're going to take a break here on Tech Strong. We're going to come right back, though, with another AI topic. This time it's networking in the age of AI. Stay tuned. You're watching Tech Strong Guy. All right, folks, and we're back and we're continuing to talk a little bit more about AI, but in a much different context, networking. It seems this is an area that maybe we've been overlooking, but a lot of the networks that we have today weren't really designed for the massive amounts of data that are going to be flowing through them in the age of AI. And looks like Intel, at least, is previewing a uh, chiplet slash system on a chip thing that they say will help uh, optimize network traffic from CPUs and GPUs. But 
Um, Guy, let's start with you. What's your sense of what's going on here? Have we kind of uncovered, shall we say, the weakest link in our whole AI setup is the network? Oh, yeah. Uh, no, no, no question. I, it's really, I'm really happy to see a developing arms race in, in high speed networking uh, for AI and also sort of, it sort of originated in the HPC world. So um, it, there's the Ultra Ethernet Consortium um, going up against InfiniBand, which is sort of the gold standard right now. And now we have this OCI, uh, all designed um, to provide um, uh, higher and higher and more and more reliable uh, bandwidth data transfer, whether it's CPU to CPU or, or more, more uh, increasingly because of AI, GPU to CPU. The, uh, the Intel chiplet um, multiplies about 16-fold um, the current standard from InfiniBand, which is about 256 gigabits per second. We're looking at four terabytes right now in this sort of prototype from Intel. And uh, we were just talking in the last segment about the importance of massive amounts of data to get a reliable and accurate AI. Um, obviously, uh, getting that data from near-term memory um, or high bandwidth memory through high bandwidth to whatever the processing units are, typically GPU, but not always, Um that makes the entire process that much easier. That's why I was saying like what seems large today may not be large just in a couple of years because as the bandwidth has been the main bottleneck. That has been the main, and it's not just a question of having uh, a, a whole lot of data that you can bring at any one time, a larger model, more data into the model. It's not just that. It's also avoiding things like packet loss, retries, ensuring that the data is available and one of the interesting things about um, this OCI chiplet from, from Intel is because it uses optical, you can actually situate the data and the GPU or CPU up to 100 meters away from each other, which makes a huge difference in terms of the physical layout of the data centers, how you run power and cooling. I mean, it has an enormous impact that I agree with you has been, has been largely overlooked. And I'm really happy to see more focus on the network now. You know... What's old is new again. I've seen this story before. Uh, first of all, let, let's guide to your point about big numbers. Let's really try to wrap our heads around four terabytes per second. Four terabits, ter but yeah. Terabits, excuse me. Four terabits per second. This is like light years distance to me, right? You know, the fact that we're even contemplating it. But secondly, look, I remember, and, and so do most of us on this panel, because we're of an age, not you, Amanda, of course, but the rest of us, gray hairs or no hairs here, are of an age where, you know, that, that bus speed, remember the bus speed of your, of your motherboard mm -hmm. and the old PCI card slots when that came out, how much faster that bus was. And that was the bottleneck for a while, right? How fast can we move? data from RAM memory into uh, on-chip memory and, and stuff like this. This is the same thing. It, you know, the numbers are, you know, the guy's point, the numbers are ridiculous compared to the numbers we dealt with back then, but it's, it's the same thing. But it also is, again, a, a trend we see in technology. When, when someone sets a new mark, the rest of the of the system needs to be brought up to that speed. Mm -hmm. And no sooner does it get up to that speed and you say, boy, we did it. We're up to that speed. What are we going to do with all this speed? Someone else comes along and says, I got a killer app that's going to need just a little more. And, and so it's this, it's almost like Moore's law kind of, 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 you know, machination. So I, you know, I don't think we'll see the end of this. I think it just keeps going up and up like that. Guy, I want to follow up on a statement you made. Puny data. What's the definition of that? <laughs> it's a bronze. It term. depends on your time window, Mike. Yeah. If you're trying to think two years ahead, it's all puny now. <laughs> uh, uh, it's not really puny. It's big. It's big because it's unprecedented compared to what we were doing just a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. I've been around long enough. 
although I still have most of my hair, I have been around long enough um, to remember when, you know, whether it was gigahertz or gigabits or gigabytes or whatever it was, 10 or 20 seemed like a huge number. And now it's not sufficient um, for any reasonable AI inference service, for example. It's just not. And that's crazy. So that's why it's crazy. crazy. Hey, yeah, Mitch, to, um, to Alan's point, connect the dot for me, if you would. Um, when we're looking at networking and storage, I don't think everybody remembers or appreciates the impact that has on utilization rates for the GPUs that we're all freaking out about the fact that we can't find and uh, makes those things incredibly inefficient. And we wind up spending a fortune on GPUs that are sitting idle waiting for traffic from networks and storage systems. Do I have that right? You got that right. And add, add to that, we now have systems on a chip, right? So we compact everything into one chip for speed and efficiency. But if your data starved, it doesn't matter how, how fast or efficient it is. I think another thing that was really stood out to me about this and thinking about is, is you've now separated the transfer of data through optical, which means it's going to run at its own frequency, its own technology, separate from the the frequency and the speed and the power of the chip. So you're not dependent upon ramping up uh, the speed of that processor to get more through data throughput for it. That's all driven by uh, the optical inputs. And to Guy's point, uh, you know, it's hard to imagine 100 meters between, it's between my desk and your desk across the office, Mike, or networking or GPUs or something. But imagine a data center where you're you're transferring that kind of data between, you know, systems in, in, in there. I would think you're talking about like not just chip to chip transfer, but also source data to your point, right? I need to get that out of that database system, right? I need to get it out of that memory database or whatever, wherever that's located, get that in and out of that system on a chip or NPU or GPU, whatever is processing that. So it, it's, it's really kind of, it, it's, it's interesting and it's also kind of hard to imagine uh, we're operating at these kinds of speeds. Of course, I, PCIe was you know phenomenal. That was you know back in the day, Alan. Oh my gosh, wow! And I could put two PCI boards right. and have a faster game at sixty frames per second. <laughs> so it's worth noting, real quick, that uh, this OCI um, uh, prototype it uses PCIe five. So we're still really? in PCIe. Mm-hmm. It's worth noting that Ultra Ethernet is still Ethernet. Yeah. yeah. Fascinating. But we don't really have IRQ conflicts anymore. I miss those. (laughs) You do. (laughs) I had some other thoughts when I was reading the article. It struck me the optical chiplet uses a lot less power. Mm -hmm. um, And you had mentioned about um, the layout and the cooling and all that. So if everybody used it, would it have less strain on the power grid, thinking about the big picture? Is it a better environmental choice? Absolutely. I've noticed, I just want to say, a profound lack of attention when it comes to AI development to, you know, power conservation, to sustainability and that sort of thing. It gets lip service, but the desire and the need to be part of the space race is far outweighs. However, Amanda and team, the thing is that the data center manager's problem is enormous when it comes to packing all these GPUs in, packing CPUs in, and getting them to run when physical proximity has had to be so important because of latency and other reasons, right? Getting the data to right next to, like literally within 10 feet of, at, at worst, is that's out the window now. And you could put all the GPUs on another floor or underground or next to a water source or all kinds of things that you couldn't do before. Yeah, somebody was telling me that there's more groundbreaking of uh, new data centers in Northern Virginia than they've seen in the last 10 years, just in the last year and a half or so. And where all the electricity for that is coming from, I'm not entirely sure. But, Guy, let me ask you another question here. So let's say I have more efficient networking and storage. Does that mean I can get by maybe with lower-cost GPUs and we're not all necessarily going to have to rush out and buy this latest generation of super high-end GPUs that 
people seem to be building and maybe we can be smarter about it. I think we can. I think it's maybe, maybe it's what, what do they call this? This is the permission structure for doing that uh, because of the underutilization and bottlenecks that you were referring to earlier. I have to say that um, I think that a lot of the like non GPU approach, CPU only approaches to AI training uh, and inference and, uh, you know, less elite GPU approaches have been valid for a really long time. Um, they're just not as safe a decision to make. You want to get the best and the greatest. So this this does help chip away at that. There's so much that you can do without having to have elite GPU-based, you know, systems. I think they'll get more energy efficient when the market demands they're more energy efficient. That, that's, again, a, a, a reoccurring theme in tech. Yeah. Right. There's there's old cowboy wisdom guy that says never mistake a clear view for a short distance. How long before all these networks are up to snuff for what we need them to be? <laughs> oh, wow. We um, It's going to take a couple of years at least, I think. But you said all. Oh, let's say the 80-20 rule, 80% of them. I think that the big providers – um, you know, the, the, the big, uh, hyperscalers and IBM and Oracle and all those folks, they're going to be very fast and very fast means 12 to 18 months. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's optimistic, but well, that's what, no, we're not talking about OCI, Alan. I'm just saying in general, it's like, no, I know, but I, I think to your earlier point from the last segment, what we think of as very fast now may not be so very fast in 18 months. And certainly won't be very fast in 36 months. And I, I just think that it's this is an arms race or a space race. And you just keep building and building. Anyway, we're going to take a break here on Tech Strong Gang. We're going to come back and we're going to move away, I think, from AI. We wanted to plug the uh, networking event at the Tech the field day folks are having? Oh, yeah. Speak, before we close out the books on networking, let's give a shout out to our friend Stephen Foskett and team at Tech Field Day, where they are, uh, it's day one of a two-day Tech Field Day on networking, and we'll be streaming it live right here on TechStrong TV. Uh, at the end of uh, TechStrong Gang today, we have a full TechStrong TV lineup, including this Tech Field Day. So you can check it out. Tech Field Day is also streamed live on the Tech Field Day LinkedIn site. And uh, the recorded version, I believe, is available on the Tech Field Day YouTube. But that probably won't be up for a day or two or more. But you can catch it all right here on TechStrong TV as Tech Field Day is now part of the TechStrong TV family. Getting hard to remember everything. It, it is. It's hard to remember any, everything <laughs> as it is. I already forgot what I'm with Ira Weekler today, but we'll come back to him. Let's take a break here. Well, let's come back and talk a little bit about security, Rock U2024 password cache, and the rise of pass keys coming up next on TechStrong Gang. All right, we're back. As Alan said, we're shifting gears to talk about cybersecurity, which is always one of our favorite subjects here. And we often disagree about a lot of things related to that. But um, there's been discovery of a new cache of passwords that are in plain text. There's nearly a billion of them. Researchers over at Cyber News kind of found these. And it seems like they've been collecting these passwords for a long time. So it's hard to say how many of them are still relevant. But um, a lot of people don't change those passwords, so there's probably some fallout from some. all of this. And 
all this is happening at a time when we're trying to convince people to maybe move away from passwords to embrace pass keys. But Mitch, um, walk us through exactly what's going on here in terms of A, how big an issue is this? And B, what is a pass key and how do we get there? How do we get there? Well, as you said, it's unclear how uh, fresh any of these passwords are. I think a number of them, I think the report or the article said about half of them are pretty old. I almost look at this as this, this is another, I'm going to bonk you on the head until you get the message about passwords, people. Look at this. This is so easy for us to collect and we've been collecting them and we'll do versions of malware and all kinds of techniques to get them. What, what it jumped out to me is your password alone is not a security measure because it's too easy for it to be compromised. Not just you're having it, but in where it's stored in whatever service or online application you're using. So if all you're using is a password, you don't have a secure account, whether it's your bank or whether it's your email system that you're getting email from. If you're using passwords, and we all do, you have to take a multi kind of security approach, right? You need system generated passwords, not password one, two, three, four, or my kid's name 2024, you know, or a rock you 2024 is my password. Um, all those can be, you know, broken too easily, but you, to prevent those kind of hacks, you want a system generated password. You also want to be using a password manager because system generated passwords, you're never going to remember, but you can make them longer which makes them more secure and harder to break. Not impenetrable, but it helps. Um, you also want to be using two-factor or multi-factor, right? Every or, or organization should, every application they use, as much as people, it's a pain for us to get out that authenticator app or send a text to ourselves um, or, or some other method in email. That's another way that some, you know, have to jump through multiple hurdles to leverage a password that they may have gotten um, up to and including doing SSO and, as I mentioned, authenticator apps. And there's a lot of things that it's it's a combination of approaches that you have to take in using passwords. And if you're not doing that, you know, you will be hacked. Those passwords are going to be hacked and they're, they're already probably hacked. So, you mean, yeah, go ahead. No, go, Mitch, finish your thought, please. Well, I was just going to say, we'll talk more about passkey, which is kind of the passwordless approach. Um you know, using the fact that you authenticate through another device like your phone, which has some biometric or other or other authentication, so that pass key capability is relying on another de- another factor, right? A device that you have that's built a trust relationship between that device and whatever service that you're logging into. But I think even pass keys are still a mystery to people. They're not sure what to do with that thing. Why well, we haven't done a great job of informing. By the way, here's here's what a pass key is, and here's what you do to use it, and why you want to use it. He just said that your Yankees win twenty twenty four password is a bad idea. Yeah, I, I never <laughs> used that as a password. Um, but I'm glad I did it. But look, I think we're looking at this all wrong, right? We're blaming the victim for being a victim. Who out here, raise your hand, likes using passwords? Who out here likes trying to think of a password that I'm going to remember when the average user has something like 150 passwords or 150 different sites that use passwords and you want to have a unique one for each one? How, who, who, who wants to play that game? No one. No one wants passwords. Don't blame the end users, though, for using passwords when it's the app vendors and the infrastructure providers who say, pick a password. Otherwise, you can't use my app. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, okay, well, I'll take that easy choice and hit generate a password that I know I'm never going to remember, but I'm going to put it in my password manager. I'm going to pay the extra money so that the password manager is not just on my computer, but on my phone. And then I got to remember my master password because I got to enter that every time I go into my password manager to get the the generated password for this. And we're going to hack that one anyway. And we're probably going to hack it anyway. Passwords suck. Everybody <laughs> hates passwords. It's not end users saying, please don't take my passwords away. Nothing would make me happier than I take one password and tell them, go where the sun don't shine. I'm done with passwords. Well, I, I agree with you about don't blame the end user. Well, you shouldn't be doing stupid passwords. But other than that, don't blame the end user. Yeah, but but you hold on a second. Yeah. Most, most hacks don't happen because they physically 
you know, uh, what's the word? Uh, powered up, uh, you know, broke through your password encryption. In other words, oh, you only had eight characters. You didn't use a special character and you only had one number. And we physic. what's, I forgot the word. What do you, when we physically. Like brute force hack it? Brute force. That's the word I'm looking Dictionary for. attack. You know, that yeah, no, it's a brute force attack. No, most most of these hacks happen from this kind of stuff where somehow or another they broke into a password store, right, from a particular vendor, and they have a whole cache. Here's a billion passwords. God knows how long it took them to mass that. But they already know your password when they're going into your account. They don't say, oh, I know Mitchell's email, and I'm just going to brute force start with password one and brute force my way in there. No, they know your password. That's where I think most hacks or breaches are coming from. They oh, fished you. Yeah, they use those. They use them in a brute force attack and try, you know, to try thousands of passwords over time to log in with your email address. Because guess what? That's usually our user ID. Yeah, but um, don't you think I, I, most attacks happen when they already have your password? They got it from. Your bank that they oh, yeah. look into well, or, or whatever. They use phishing to get your password or right. some other method, right? To or get worse, it. they, get, they use phishing to get someone else's password, and that's yeah. how they find it. With credentials. Access. Yeah. You know, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to disagree with the blaming of the victim thing, and I'm going to go back to some Bronx analogies here. But if I take my fancy car, drive it to certain sections of the Bronx. And shade leave, the bonfire of the vanities. And, and, I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I leave the windows open and the keys are in the car and the car gets stolen. Cops are going to come, take my report, and then they're going to shake their head and be somewhat sympathetic. And then when I go home, they're going to go have a beer somewhere and go, did you hear about this idiot? <laughs> Well, that's typical <laughs> cops in the Bronx, right? But the fact of the matter is, yes, we can choose harder passwords. Yes, we can all use password managers. Yes, we should sign up for the multi-factor authentication. The onus is on the tech industry to eliminate, make obsolete the use of passwords. And if pass keys are the way of doing it, I'm all for it. Mitch, I agree with you. We've done a shitty job, a crappy job, excuse my language. We've done a crappy job of explaining what pass keys are and how they work and why you should be using them. But I will tell you, whenever I am given the option of using a pass key on a particular login these days, I choose it every time. And then I wait for it to tell me that go check your iPhone, your iPad, your watch, your wife or whatever. Uh, to get to get your pass key, but I I I love using them and not having to remember more passwords. Time out for a second. Speaking of shitty jobs, we have not exactly explained what a pass key is. So, Mitch, take a crack at it. What exactly is a pass key? So, so what it is is um, it's generating a secret um, because you're logging into an application and it's in it's saying, "Would you like to generate a pass key for this application?" If it's the first time. Like let's say in your Chrome browser or whatever, it's it's going to rely on a Chrome application to say, is this okay? Is this somebody is trying to create a pass key for this application to log into this Google app or whatever app it is? That generates a uh, a token, a security token based on private keys in the background, public keys that are exchanged, just a normal PKI exchange that says this is this user because we trust the device that they're saying they are who they are, their, their phone. Um, or it can be a, it can also be another computer as long as it has some kind of, um, uh, you know, biometric uh, verification on it. Then that has key, it is a key. Of course, you can't remember that either. So it gets stored in your password manager, just like you would a password. And then it fills that in the next time that it comes in, supplying it. It can also be built into the browser and other options too. So it's, in a way, it's a password. It's just, and it's a system generated password. It's just done with PKI in ways that, you know, are much, much more secure. The problem is it, to me, is the user experience isn't seamless yet. No. Too many times you go to an app and say, I want to, I want to generate a passkey for this. And says, I, had, I love the message. I had trouble generating a passkey. See your administrator. Right? How many people are going to call up the help desk to say, I can't generate a passkey for my home email system from work or whatever. So it, it's got a ways to go. Um, but I also, I also want to, I want to agree and disagree with Alan. Agree on one point, disagree on another one. 
You know what, Alan? The day passwords go away or the day email goes away. I would love email to go away. If email would go away, I would spend the rest of my life trying to get rid of passwords, but it's never going to happen. There will always be passwords out there. We're always going to need some methods of protecting as much as you and I and everybody else hates them. On the other side, we need our tech vendors, the people providing services to us, to enforce better security, not just generated passwords for us and save them in your browser, but force two-factor authentication. Google did this a while back where they're going to start forcing it, and, and it's improved everybody's security. But the provider can do more things than just generate a, a, a good password, per se. And you know, you're doing it for the betterment of your customers because you don't want your customer data, your customer's access to get hacked. And I think that's a responsibility that the tech providers have. So let's make security better for our customers. I think there's also a cultural aspect to this in uh, app- application development and, and in the the applications that vendors are, are you know, developing and providing of, um, y- you know, let's, let's assume a breach. Let's assume breaches already exist and let's let's develop accordingly. Um, I'm not talking about zero trust, which assumes that no node can be trusted to be secure. I'm talking about um, the fact that containment and minimizing, you know, blast radius um, are also important. It, it, it takes me back to this, you know, the, the, how all these discussions tend to be so binary, black and white, either nothing allowed or or everything's wide open, what do we do? I think that a lot of these systems are already compromised. And to the extent that we can drive a an application development culture that takes that as assumed, that is within the tech industry and it's better controlled than trying to get people to create good passwords. I have a couple of thoughts on this. As far as the personal protection obligation on our end, I love the facial recognition, which bypasses everything. Um, First of all, I guess my question is, um, do we think that's pretty safe just using facial recognition? Or maybe we could use two biometric uh, methods, facial recognition and voice recognition or something like that. But as far as the password, I was given a tip a few years ago that I try to use. And I'm wondering what your opinion is. This is a safe password option. I've just come up with sentences because I can remember a sentence maybe a little bit easier. So I write out a whole sentence as my password. Well, I don't know, but I, I know one thing. Uh, If I had to see my face every morning, I'd be scared crap. (laughs) Um, But, but I will tell you with AI, you could probably fake face and voice potentially. But in in any event, Mitch, I, I almost want to raise my glass when guy said glass radius, huh? Oh yes, absolutely. <laughs> it's it's time. Okay, let's let's do it for guy. Blast radius. Aww, you know what? Thank we, you. Uh, we what was that? Wasn't it DevOps of DevOps down? down. We, we had a rule. Our... Anytime you use the word blast radius, you have to do it. Word. So I'll, I'm gonna I'm gonna because you said AI. I'm raising okay, my glass to you. Go for it then. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, guys, we've got to. I we could talk about this all day. I'm sure. And Amanda, you had some some good points there. I sometimes use sentences too, by the way. Um, but we we need to take a break here. We've hit our three uh, topics, but we've got some bonus material for you. First of all, you know, in continuing our tradition of uh, Andy Rooney uh, kind of one-offs, we, we have two Andys that we have. Sometimes we have our friend Bob Wrestleman, Roll Bob, and then sometimes we have our friend Ira Winkler. And uh, today we have a Bite Me segment from Ira Winkler, where Ira is going to talk about, Mike, do you remember? Uh, something he's angry about. I do. Yes. I do. He's going to talk about <laughs> why the Joe Biden. No, uh, he's going to be talking about why thinking like a hacker is not always a good strategy. That that's Absolutely. Not- so he's going to counter that, that idea with some really good thoughts about it. And Ira is a person who knows from this, right? If you oh, know does. anything about his his career and history. So here's a uh, bite me with Ira Winkley, the Ira Winkler segment on why thinking like a hacker may not be the best way to approach security. <laughs>
Hi, this is Ira Winkler with today's edition of Bite Me. The one thing I want to really address, and, you know, frankly, it's going to be ironic coming from me, is I really hate the concept of thinking like a hacker, like we have to think like hackers, and that's somehow a good thing. Fundamentally, it really isn't. And let me be honest, I made my career by doing penetration tests and thinking like a hacker early on. I made my reputation taking over banks, stealing nuclear reactor designs, and the like. The reality was, was I had such little impact in actual security programs. It was amazing. And let me say, I did have a good impact, but it was little. And what I mean by that was, let me tell you when a, you know, thinking like a hacker might work. In other words, performing a penetration test and so on. So, for example, if you want to go ahead and you need to get management attention on how bad your security is or the fact security needs to be improved, that's one thing. If you have a mature program in place and need to find some additional vulnerabilities that might not be accounted for to see where your blind spots are, perfect example of when to use a red team, think like a hacker. You know, another case where you have software, you think you have a good process in place, you want to go ahead, perform application testing by, you know, hacking the applications. Okay, great. The reality, though, is that this is only useful after you have a strong program in place. And thinking like a hacker is thinking like an amateur. Because frankly, I, like, again, I've been involved with Walmart's program, HP's program. I've consulted probably to give or take two thirds of the Fortune 100 at one point in time or another. And the reality is you don't want somebody who thinks like a hacker, thinking like a hacker, oh, think outside the box. That's not a good thing. By the way, that's another present se session. But the reality is you need to have figure out how do I put together a comprehensive cybersecurity program that's resilient to attacks by quote unquote hackers with my Dr. Evil quotes that also takes care of 99% of the problems by you can think like a hacker. You have to think like a security professional. And this means you have to go ahead. You have to understand your limitations. Your but You have budget limitations. You have political limitations. You have personnel limitations. You have human resource limitations. And I mean by keeping your people happy, keeping them well-staffed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you have to go ahead and secure against all the world's potential ills within very, very harsh limitations. You don't have the luxury to think like a hacker. Oh, I'm just going to come in from the outside and do things nobody else can. You have to go ahead and think, look, I need to put a systematic program in place that is repeatable, that addresses all of the concerns of the organization that says, hey, Yes, thinking like a hacker, hey, if I just shut off everything, that would be perfect. But I need to enable the business to run as a CISO. And you cannot go ahead and have think like a hacker. You have to, th the most brilliant people there are, are CISOs of Fortune X companies who are out there realizing they have a plethora of vulnerabilities, a plethora of attackers. And they have to put a program in place that accounts for regulations, that accounts for privacy concerns, that accounts for just about every concern an organization has on top of the limitations of budget, people, training, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can't maintain a strong cybersecurity program thinking like a hacker and thinking outside the box. This again is a topic for another presentation but the best hackers don't think outside the box. They redesign the box. And as a cybersecurity professional, your job is to figure out how to protect that box from re being redesigned. And I know that's a very fine line in differentiation, but thinking like a hacker, you know, oh, I'm going to go ahead and do this and this and this. Awesome. But that's if you are, let, let me give you this concept. Basically, in large programs, they do have people who think like hackers. That is probably 1% to 3% of a large cybersecurity program. So if you're dealing with a cybersecurity program 
of over 500 people. They might have five people going ahead and doing the red teaming and the like and periodically hire outside companies to figure out where are the vulnerabilities they didn't plan for, where are the vulnerabilities that the box has produced, and that's the right use of it. But fundamentally, you don't think like a hacker. And even a hacker inside a large cybersecurity program doesn't think like a hacker. They think like a security professional because it's easy to do what I call pulling a Nelson, which is going, ha ha, I got you. And I did a lot of gotchas throughout the decades. That was not overly useful. The gotchas are only useful when I found systematic problems that need to be addressed and could be addressed in a comprehensive way. Yeah, I could pull out a zero-day vulnerability. Yeah, I could pull out a few things and get in. Getting in isn't the hard part. Protecting people from getting in is the hard part. And too many people are fascinated with hackers, and they need to stop that. They need to be fascinated by the cybersecurity teams that are out there on a daily basis stopping attacks from all over the world. So don't think like a hacker. If you want to challenge, think like a cybersecurity professional. That's Ira Winkler for this edition of Bite Me. One thing about my friend Ira Winkler, he's never short on his opinion and he's not afraid to share it. It's great to have him. And thanks, Ira, very much for that. If you have any questions or comments on that, though, you should write to Bite Me at techstronggroup.com and we'll get it over to Ira and he can address those to you. Guys, before we wrap up, Mitchell, I know you wanted to talk about a segment coming up on TechStrong TV today. Yeah, I really want to highlight um, an interview that I did with Cassie Crossley. She is an author of a new book. New book came out in March. Um, it's on software supply chain security. But what I think is unique about her book, she has a couple of decades of work in security and in software um, at a company because she works at Snyder Electric, who deals with hardware as well as embedded systems as well as software. And so she, her her book on supply chain security is looking at hardware, firmware, and software and how you think about that supply chain. And she kind of wrote it for multiple audiences where you're a software developer, you're a hardware engineer, or you're a firmware engineer, you're a compliance person, you're in a leadership role. Try to make a really accessible book and and Wow. I mean, talking to her, you, you'll you see. She gets going and you just kind of sit back and listen and learn. So uh, please watch that segment because Cassie is fantastic. And I think you'll get a lot out of what she's, do, what she's doing in her work. And uh, there'll be a link in the description to the book uh, at O'Reilly. You can get it there. All right. That's on Tech Strong TV today. As I mentioned earlier, we also have our Tech Field Day, day one of Networking Tech Field Day on Tech Strong TV, and that's going to be, if you've never seen a Tech Field Day, it's pretty cool. Mitchell and I participated in one last month. Um, with Jack Guy. Actually, Guy did too, yeah. didn't you? Yeah, with Guy. Yeah, now that I'm it. thinking about it, yeah. Um, so do check out Tech Field Day. Check out the rest of our Tech Strong TV. We will be back tomorrow for our great Thursday show. Can't wait to have that one with more gang members. But until then, Mike, thanks very much. It's great to have you back here in warm, sunny Florida. And I don't care what you say. I'll be in the race tomorrow. You'll be in the race tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and then we've got Mitchell Guy, your very first uh, Tech Strong Gang. Thanks. Guy gets a thumbs up, right? He can come back again? Yeah, I think we got to get him some colors to wear. Yeah. There we go. And then Amanda this is, is so always funny great job. I knew, I knew to wear the colors, and then I just... I just, I, I know what to do. <laughs> All right. Next time, no next time we'll get you. Amanda, it's great to have you on as always. Keep up the great work on techstrong.ai and digitalcxo.com. And we'll see you soon on another TechStrong gang. SecurityBoulevard.com is the leading resource for news, analysis, and education on challenges facing the cybersecurity industry. SecurityBoulevard.com covers all aspects of cybersecurity, including data security, DevSecOps, cloud security, application security, network security, security threats, and more. SecurityBoulevard.com has the largest selection of security content, featuring breaking news, blog posts, podcasts, and more. 
Visit www.securityboulevard.com to learn more. Securityboulevard.com, home of Security Bloggers Network.